This is Scary Terry's Saturday Nightmare from Rock 94.7. Hey there, I'm Terry Stevens, the host of Scary Terry's Saturday Nightmare, heard every Saturday night from 9 until midnight on Rock 94.7, also online at rock947.com. Our internet broadcast brought to you by Ace Hardware and Nigra's Fine Furniture. Welcome to Scary Terry's Saturday Nightmare's 13 Questions where we sit down with the men and the women who make the metal that you love and pick their brains a bit. This week, we sit down with Greg McIntosh of Paradise Lost and find out about his brand new project, Volunfire. In 2009, Greg McIntosh, who you may know as the lead guitarist for Paradise Lost, lost his father to cancer. His writings during the grieving process became the basis of the debut album for his new band, Volunfire. They've just released their debut album on Century Media Records. It's called A Fragile King. Greg, thank you for joining us tonight to talk about the album. Not a problem, Terry. It's my pleasure. Now, before anything else, uh, my condolences to you and your family on the loss of your father. Two years later, how are you doing? Um, I'm good. I mean, it's, it's one of them things, you know, I've been asked about this um, whether it's helped me get over it and I wouldn't say yes or no really it's not something you really get over it's something that you kind of learn to accept just as part of life you know it's uh, I mean most this will happen to everyone and uh, most people who've been through it probably know what I mean but it's just um, something that kind of never goes away but it's uh, it's just something that you know, you just learn to accept as time goes on, I guess, you know. Now, uh, let's talk about uh, a bit more about the, the inspiration behind this album. I mean, from the heavy, heavy, low-end rumble of this uh, of this amazing album to its lyrical content, A Fragile King, it, it's dark, it's grim, and obviously you were in a rough place emotionally when you were writing, but was the recording process hard for you emotionally as well? No, no, that was, that was a lot of fun. I mean... Um, it started off in the beginnings of 2010 as, like you say, more of a catharsis, like uh, writing things to get them off my chest or whatever. Uh, but slowly throughout the course of 2010, as, as the band members became involved and the songwriting progressed, um, it started to become more of a something that's more of a tribute, you know, and just more of something that's fun to do with friends. And the recording was just a blast. We just had a real good time with it. And, um, you know, didn't have any big plan for it all. We just knew what kind of sound we wanted and what kind of vibe we wanted and just went with it. And, uh, yeah, no, it was, it was a lot of fun. It was quite the opposite of what you would imagine it would be, you know. Greg, when it comes to songs that are inspired by grief, we usually get something along the lines of uh, yeah, Eric Clapton, Tears in Heaven, or Sarah McLaughlin in the Arms of an Angel. That is to say, we usually get the sadness of grief but none of the anger that comes with grief. How important was it for you to capture the anger of the grieving process? Well, I think the anger that comes with grief, I mean, it probably doesn't hit everyone, but it hit me pretty hard. Um, it's something that took me by surprise. wasn't really expecting it, you know. Um, and I guess I just had a, a lot of anger there, and I didn't know how to deal with it. And uh, this just seemed like the perfect place to channel it, I guess. Um, it's, you know, I mean, people say there's these different stages of grief, and I guess there are, and some people get them and some people don't. Um, I kind of went through the whole thing, and I'm one of three brothers, and we all handled it completely differently. Um, you know, my younger brother was very methodical about it, and I just got very angry, so um, I guess it's just each to their own how they deal with things, and I just channeled it into this project, you know. Now, there are a ton of metal songs with lyrics about fathers who are absent deadbeats or abusive monsters, but your lyrics about your father refer to him as your king. Can you tell us more about your relationship with him? Yeah, he was, um, he was just an easygoing guy, you know, like a very um, affable type of person that was just really good to be around. And he was kind of the linchpin of my family, and I never really realized it while he was alive, you know. Me and my brothers kind of gravitated towards him. Um, he never took life too seriously, and he was uh, kind of interested in how things worked a lot, which was kind of really why he became um, instrumental in the early days of Paradise Lost. You know, he was just interested in what we did, uh, kind of more in a hands-on way than most fathers might have been. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it, it, it was kind of just one of the things. That, I call him a king on the record, but it was more, it was more that, I looked up to him in a way that um, I aspired to be like him in his persona, 
you know, not taking life too seriously and kind of being laid back. And, um, you know, I aspire to be like that, drift through life and not take it too seriously and take it a day at a time because I think that just, that is a good way to be in life, I think. Absolutely, absolutely. You're listening to 13 Questions with Scary Terry's Saturday Nightmare on Rock 94.7. Our conversation with Greg McIntosh of Paradise Lost and now Volunfire continues. Now, let's talk a bit more about the band. Uh, Volunfire features members of My Dying Bride, uh, Doom, At the Gates, and of course, you're a founding member of Paradise Lost. Now, we could call, we could be lazy heavy metal journalists and call it a death metal supergroup, but there's more to that with these guys for you, isn't there? Yeah, we go a long way back. The, the, the fact that everyone's in different bands with varying degrees of success is, is kind of a sideline thing. I mean, I know these guys for many, many years, and we're all very good friends. Um, and we've always just all been into the music and very, very involved in it in our own ways separately. Um, so, you know, it, it, you know, I've been in the music business for maybe 20-something years. So it, it kind of comes with the territory that a lot of your friends are involved in this, you know. Um, you know, Scoot from Doom, who, who's the bass player, I used to share a house with him when we were, uh, like, early 20s. Uh, he was late teens at the time. Um, and Hamish from My Dying Bride, we grew up in the same town. I've known him for many, many years as well. So it's, it's just one of the things. We're just good friends. And we grew up with a passion for this sort of music. And we were involved in a very similar sort of scene. Adrian, obviously, he's Swedish. But he's lived in London for the last 10 years. And he was, he was involved in the tape trading scene around the late 80s. And, um, we're, we're showing our age know. talking about tape trading now. We, there's some little kid on the other side. What's a tape, Dad? <laughs> Ask well, your parents. Exactly, though. <laughs> exa- exactly. I mean, it even comes down to things like, when I was writing the Valentine record, I was thinking, will this fit on one side of a C90? <laughs> <You know? laughs> That's beautiful. That's beautiful. Um, now, have other members of Valentine had to deal with cancer in their own families? Yeah, well, what's kind of um, strange about this, I mean, I, I do actually make my living from music, but a couple, of, a couple of guys in the band are in bands but don't actually make their living from it. Um, and Hamish from My Dying Bride, when he's not doing My Dying Bride, he's actually a counsellor for um, victims of terminal cancer and their families. So he knows it very, very well. He knows it inside out, you know. He helped me a lot. Um, the guys, know I'd written maybe 70% of the record before anyone else became involved. But um, he helped me a lot because I, I was over kind of at the time my dad's illness and in the aftermath. I was over in my hometown a lot. Uh, visiting my mother and family and whatever else. And most nights I'd go to the pub with Hamish and just kind of vent a little bit. And he's probably used to this. It's kind of, you know, it's probably plain sailing for him to have to, Mm. you know, soak this kind of information in. So, yeah, he did help me a lot in in other ways, I guess, you know. I do have a a question about one particular member of the band. Uh, I I have to ask, what's the story with Mully from the pub? I mean, he's got the alias. (laughs) Is is he hiding from the KGB? (laughs) No, no, no. It's, uh, a few people brought this up, but it's, it, it's literally where I found him <laughs> in the pub, and that's where he spends most of his days, fortunately or unfortunately. Um, it's just because um, he's a he's another good friend of ours, but um, he's only been in like kind of local bands that no one's ever really heard of. Um, but he, he grew up with the same kind of music, has the same passion for it, and he's been playing guitar a long time and. Like I say, you don't have to necessarily be in a famous band to be part of this. It was just it was choosing the right people who were going to have fun with it, you know, who who would enjoy traveling together and just have a good laugh with it. And he he just happened to be one of those people. And when we were writing the biography for it, we were writing, you know, like Greg from Paradise Lost, Hamish from My Dame Bright, and what could we put in brackets for Mully and that's all we could think of from the pub, you know, so <laughs> that's how that came about. Uh, we just wanted to make sure he wasn't on, like, an Al-Qaeda watch list or something like that. Uh, Not that I know of. <laughs> <laughs> well, with that being said, uh, if he has, I guess we'll find out if you guys, uh, do you guys have any plans to tour the U.S., maybe with a stop in the great state of Wisconsin? Well, this is, this is um, like I said, we don't really have a, any kind of big master plan for um, Valentire, but the thing that I've noticed while I've been doing interviews for, for this record is that there seems to be quite a hunger coming from the States more than anywhere else, which kind of shocked me. And then I've, I've realized as I've gone along that a lot of people uh, 
over there have kind of missed out on the first wave of European death metal. And um, they're kind of hungering for it. And I guess Valenfire would be a good link to that. Um, so it, it is my goal now to try and get us over there. So every interview I do, uh, radio interview or whatever, for uh, you know, in the US, I'm kind of asking if people like the record to pester their local promoter. And uh, that's, that's kind of the way that we're going to get there. You know? I think I can give you some insight on that. Um, I can't speak to the rest of the uh, 49 states, but as far as Wisconsin, uh, much like Scandinavia, it's cold as hell up here all the time, and we're miserable and angry, and death metal helps us cope. So <laughs> <laughs> That sounds like the north of England. Yeah, we, we, we got the corpse paint on and the whole thing, man. Well, actually, it's not corpse paint. It's uh, Green Bay Packers face paint, but it's along the same line. Oh. So, yeah, there you go.